a texture that looked like um, cracks in the ground. And then go to light. So you can add a point light, a sunlight, a spotlight, and area light. Emission with a really low roughness. And then one is a gradient texture with a color ramp connected to the emission. I know that Blender can be very intimidating, like you said, when coming into it. And I think the donut tutorial is really, really excellent for... Welcome to 3D Art with Gabe. I'm your host, Gabe. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a 3D modeler by trade. What that means is that I use a computer to make things like cars or vehicles or buildings. Uh, I make a virtual model of those that are used in virtual environments like video games. And I am creating a show all about that process that I get to share with you. This show is originally inspired by The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross, one of my favorite shows on public television where we all got to watch Bob Ross make these beautiful portraits of landscapes and anything else, mostly landscapes, of course. And uh, he would invite us to, to follow along. Well, I'm very excited to do a, uh, what I would consider an updated version of that with digital art. Um, the primary tool that I'll be using in this show is Blender. Blender is a free software. I'll emphasize free there. So you can download it at any time. Uh, and uh, Blender is a very powerful tool that allows you to make 3D models. It allows you to sculpt virtually. It allows you to create textures and materials that are photo realistic. It is an amazing tool. And it's my intention to share that tool with you, the audience, and how it works. Who is this show for? I mentioned earlier that uh, I was a big fan of The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. That show is an, an educational all ages show. That's very much the exact same thing as this. This show is all ages. I have a special place in my heart for teachers. I'm a former middle school teacher myself and I have a lot of friends and family members that teach high school. And they incorporate a lot of art and creativity into their show. For that reason, I wanna show how you can do things that you would do in school, like make models of anything at all from, you know, current events or history or, you know, um, English classes or anything culturally in Blender and do it virtually. Uh, in this show, we are going to interview guests who work in the video game industry. We're going to, we will be interviewing guests who work in um, animation, who do commercials, who do music videos, also who do 3D printing, and also some guests who use artificial intelligence to create art entirely automatically, believe it or not. Uh, today, I have a very, very special guest that I found on TikTok. Uh, he's also on Instagram and YouTube, and he goes by the handle Lenica Digital. And we have him joining us on Zoom, and he's going to show us some music videos that he's made, as well as some TikTok videos, and talk about his journey and how he runs a business in doing 3D modeling. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our guest, uh, Lenica Digital, who, whose uh, real name is Liam. Liam, can you join us? Hey. How are you, sir? I'm doing super well. Awesome, awesome. I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, I would like, I think I'd like to start off by showing our guests some of what you do. Can you show us one of your videos? This is the intro video that I use on my U YouTube channel. It's about five weeks old at this point. So I'm still definitely getting up there with YouTube videos, but uh, this is one I like to show off for at first. That was entirely done in Blender, and more specifically, that was all procedurally UFO done. UFO Invasion. Oh, that's another one playing. Um, that uses the geometry node system that was uh, recently overhauled in Blender 3.0. Um, it It is something that I have always liked to work with in node networks. I know a lot of people do procedurally generated textures, um, but using the geometry nodes is actually geometry that's also procedural. Okay. Now, real quick, before we get into the weeds with uh, Geometry Nodes, I actually wanted to show our audience just your landing page for either your TikTok or your Instagram, so we can see a variety of the videos that you, ha that you ha have up there. Can you show us your page? Yeah, totally. Um, and also, uh, where can our audience find you if they just search for at Lenica Digital? Yeah, if, honestly, if you just go to Google and search Lenica Digital, I'm pretty sure the entire first page is me as well um so if you just type that in google or on any of the platforms you'll find lenica digital okay very good 
Uh, so this is my TikTok channel. It's probably the place that I get the most views from. I, I think I get around 400,000 views a month on my TikTok. It's not as much as my um, actual pieces that I produce. It's a lot like showing kind of uh, small tips and tricks. Not all TikToks go that well, but it's really a numbers game with TikTok. So I'll show this one off. When I first started on Blender, one of the most requested commissions that I get is turning their 2D logo into 3D. Not sure if there's a video online telling you how to do this, but I wanted to create my own video showing you how to disconnect all the objects, cut them out, and then add your own textures to them. If you're a graphic designer or Blender artist and you don't know how to do this, uh, really consider checking out my YouTube video. I just posted it like 30 seconds ago, and I think it has some really useful information. So if you wanted to give me a follow and a like on there, that would be greatly appreciated. I uh, hope to see you in the video. Yeah, 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 it's all good. That's actually a very, very incredible video. I know that so many digital artists out there are very, very often asked to do things like logos. I, I've been asked to do logos since may you know since college um so that's a very very common one so the fact that uh the skill set to make a logo in 3d exists and you actually have a youtube video all about that that's incredible mm -hmm. so obviously i'm hoping that our audience of course will check out your youtube channel and learn more about how to do a logo and other skill sets as well um i want to ask you a few questions how did you get your start in blender so um, I actually had no intention of doing 3D art when I first started this. Um, I was, I'm in entrepreneurship. I'm still in college. I'm a third year out of five at Drexel University. And um, for my entrepreneurship degree, I wanted to start a new business. Uh, I didn't have any idea what that business was going to be. But uh, about a month after I started in the major, there was a competition. And the competition was a pitch competition for a made up a made up. Um, I made a business and the business idea that I had was called water weights. Um, water weights was a, it was kind of like a plastic weight that you fill with water to determine how heavy or how light you wanted to like lift with like a dumbbell. And so the point of it was five pounds of water, 10 pounds of water, and you'd only have to buy one weight. And that would offset the cost of shipping heavy metals because a set of dumbbells can be like over a hundred dollars right now. And so the way I got into Blender is I had the pitch this thing. And I'm like, how do I really let the judges know what is what this water weights thing is about? And I decided to learn 3D modeling. And I wanted to do that because I knew if people could visually see what I was talking about, there was a more likely chance that I'd win the $500. Um, and so actually, the first 3D models that I did for the water weights design, um, I'm sharing them on my screen now. So this is um this is kind of the first demonstration of it where I wanted to have like a screw and then a a jug that you fill to a certain level of gallons and um one gallon of water is eight pounds so depending on how many gallons you filled it with that's how much water you're gonna get and so these are the initial sketches and then um, when I got into Blender I came up with my first animation which is this one. Uh, this was kind of showing the proof of concept to the judges, showing how a, a, um, something like this would work. This was also the landing page to the website that I built. Uh, it was just so people could sign up and kind of check the updates with the, with the program. Um, and so after I entered this pitch competition, I actually ended up winning it. People were really... Um, really amazed by the 3D modeling that I did. And this was the first thing I ever did. So I was like, yeah, this, this is pretty awesome. People like what I do. Um, I've been an artist for basically all my life, just doing 2D, but, 2D, but I've never stepped into the realm of um, like digital art. And so after that, I was like, okay, I got to, I got to keep doing this uh, because it was just, it was just so fun. So I ended up doing the Beeple Everyday Challenge. And uh, for those of you guys who don't know who Beeple is, the um, Beeple is a 3D artist who has been doing 3D renderings every day for the last, I think around seven, maybe going at eight years. He's one of the most famous 3D artists, uh, artists at this moment. And I was like, I was talking to my friend and I'm like, you know, Beeple has been doing this forever now. I wonder what would happen if like we just started doing everyday art. Um, and so my friend, Jacob Fluharty, uh, you can find him at, at Jacob Fluharty, Fluharty. <laughs> but um, we started doing 3D art. And when, when we were kind of late at night, it was like one or 2 a.m. We would just kind of post something online and we got the we got the idea from, like I said, people before and uh, some other daily artists. When we started looking into the like daily art movement, we saw all these people who had grown really big followings online by just posting whatever they were doing for the day. And so we're like, you know, we really want to become better artists. And what better way to do that than to actually start doing the artwork? Awesome. Awesome. You know, one of the things I, wanna, I wanted to talk to you about is when you first learned Blender, obviously it's very, very exciting. And I found it to be 
quickly overwhelming. Uh, there's just so many tabs, so many buttons. Uh, luckily, I found some really good guided tutorials that, that took me through every single element in Blender. I'd like to share mine, but before I do, I'd like to ask you, how did you learn how to get started in Blender? And is there a suggested resource that you like to point people to? Yeah, so I mean, the one that everybody gives is the uh, Blender Guru Donut tutorial. And um, while I absolutely love Blender Guru, he's been one of the biggest inspirations for me and my um, art career. Um, I, I actually think that there are a little bit easier ones to start with. I know that Blender can be very intimidating, like you said, when coming into it. And I think the donut tutorial is really, really excellent for showing people a lot of the tools that most people use in the industry. Um, I ended up, I ended up watching a few videos by Ducky 3D. Um, Ducky 3D does a lot of motion graphics um, in his Blender art. And so he does a lot of like, kind of like abstract moving colorful shapes. And um, it's just very visually appealing. So I started getting the basics down was just straight up modeling and texturing first. Nice, nice. Yeah, the site that I used, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's CG Boost. I actually sent him a message on, on um, Twitter and I asked if he'd like to be on this show. So hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll hear back from him. Um, I, oh gosh, I'm blanking on, on the gentleman's name. Uh, CG Boost has a free course uh, that I did it's, I want to say close to 30 hours total. So it's a considerable, it's a considerable time investment, but he teaches you how to model a, uh, it's like a picnic table with a basket of shiny apples. Um, mm -hmm. And it's uh, photo realistic. And the fact that after this course, I could model something that looked photo realistic. I was really impressed by that. So I thought that was pretty cool. He does organic modeling and hard service modeling and all, and all, and all the terms. And I don't intend to go into the weeds right now, but uh, <laughs> That, that was my idea. I've also heard of the donut tutorials. Those are very, very famous. So mm -hmm. really anybody could Google anything. I think for me, my favorite thing to start with though was sculpting in Blender. That was the easiest to slide into and the most fun I had um, at first. Mm -hmm. At least, at least uh, I, I can definitely remember the first time that I sculpted. Um, what's really nice about doing that everyday challenge like that I was referring to is that I actually have every single one of the pieces that I started with. And so every time I did another piece, I was seeing the first time using that like type of method in Blender. And so I, I remember my first rig and I remember my first um, sculpt. And I have I actually have all the pictures here. I, I had to dig through terabytes and terabytes of files to find these, but I actually found 150 56 of my uh, everyday projects. Okay, um, yeah, let's see them. And you can, you can all find these on my Instagram as well, Lenica Digital, if you just scroll to the very, very bottom. I started that Instagram with the intention of just doing daily art. Um, and so my first sculpt was this one. Uh, it's a little, it's a little abstract and weird, but that's one of the reasons I liked it so much. This was after watching um, Melody Sheep has a video called... Um, Alien, it was Alien Museum or the Museum of Alien Life. And I was so inspired by that video. It's it's just like what other alien life could look like depending on what type of environment they they grew up on and if they were like carbon-based life forms or like silicon-based life forms. And it was very conceptual. And so I watched that and I'm like, I could totally get to that point. And whenever I see a video like that or, or watch a cool movie with cool CGI, I always think to myself, like, I could totally do that. And then it ends up looking more like this instead of like the photorealistic beauty that they have. But that's just the learning process. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Wow. <laughs> Let's see some of, your, some of the other work that, that you've done on your journey. Yeah. Okay. I can, I can show you. Here's here's one that I did. This was right. This was right after I kind of stopped working on water weights. I I went to a I went to a factory and I tried to get them manufactured and it was just going to cost so much money. And so I'm like, you know, I'm I'm really getting into 3D art now and I don't really need the startup idea water weight. So I'm just going to more focus on making money through selling posters. And so I made this piece from the three, my three favorite pieces at the time, all 11 by 17. And so these I put in kind of like a sort of museum 
uh, a 3D museum to advertise uh, to other people about what I was selling. So I have, I think 50, I used to have 50 versions of this print that I would sell on the side of the street next to my college. And so when people were walking by, I would just be like, hey, do you want to buy a poster? It's it's $15. And I was making them for like 70 cents. I, I had a really good printing gig uh, there. And so I was I was profiting, profiting like $9 per, per print. And that's how I, how I started the idea of making money with art and with 3D. Um, and then eventually I got to commissions um, kind of after I stopped my everyday stuff. Nice, nice. And actually seeing that art has inspired me. Uh, at the very end of our interview, I put this little part with a question mark. And I said, can we do a tutorial question mark? <laughs> That's at the end of the interview, but how would you feel about doing it right now? I'm just, I'm kind of inspired. A tutorial of what? Can you sculpt something? Like, um, oh. I can try. <laughs> okay, so a couple nights ago, check this out. A couple nights ago, I was doing 3D modeling in Blender on my computer, and my <laughs> stepdaughter came up, and, and she asked if I could do a Halloween thing. So I did a, a Jack Skellington head. It, it was just, it probably took me, I think, four minutes from start to finish. And I mm -hmm. took that time to show her, here's how you can press F and resize the size of your, of your brush. If you hold control, it'll take away the clay, the virtual clay, of, of course. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't hold control, if you just click, it'll add clay, that kind of thing. Uh, would you mind doing that? Yeah, so, totally. Uh, I, I have my screen up now and I'll start from the default Blender layout so everybody can kind of follow along. Um, I might be using a couple add-ons from Blender that I have. I'll explain those add-ons and where you can find them. Okay. Um, but so this is the default Blender scene. Uh, of course, you have to delete the default cube because it should never be there. And I'm going to add an icosphere. And with this icosphere, the reason I'm using it is because as you can see here, the vertices, these triangles are actually all equidistant from each other. If you were to use a UV sphere, you actually have triangles and squares or rectangles here. And that's not exactly what you want. And so I'm just going to stick with this right now. So I'm going to go into the sculpting tab, which is at the top left. And I'm going to go down to Dynatopo. Uh, Dynatopo is kind of like magically adding clay if you want to consider this icosphere a ball of clay and um, usually when you don't have dinotopo off if you try to sculpt it's only going to make these vertices bigger like the ones that you already have however with dinotopo you can click that and then you can add clay to your to your leisure and however you want and so i like doing that when i'm doing quick things i don't really care about how many vertices there are and that's not a luxury that everybody has if you work in a game studio and you really need to work on how optimized the game is you wouldn't be able to do this because as if i tab into edit mode you can see i've already added hundreds hundreds of more vertices here and that's just not always something that um, people can afford um and so i guess i am going to make a little little alien plant that's kind of what i'm feeling right now uh, maybe it's because we were looking at some of my old work and i was i was remembering the animal um the alien museum and that's now back in my head so i'm just going to give these kind of like a almost like a barnacle look i'm going to extrude down i'm holding control with this um, blob tool and what that does is it'll subtract uh vertices whereas if you just click regularly it'll uh, make them taller and then holding control it'll push them down so it's not like i have to switch from this button up here up down up down it you can just kind of do it from wherever so once i put once I put some holes in this geometry right here, I, I think that's looking pretty good. I don't like how, how much triangles you can see here. So I'm just going to flatten it down by holding shift. Shift is the universal tool for smoothing a, uh, smoothing a mesh. And that's looking about good. And then if I go back into my layout panel, I am now going to add another icosphere with four subdivisions, shrink that down. And then give this a material of just like very shiny and dark. Um, and these are going to be what I consider eyes coming out of this alien plant. So I'm going to put one there. I'm duplicating these objects with shift D um, and then putting them in place just using um, some of the axes. So if you see these lines pop up right now, the, uh, the green line and the red line, that's me clicking G and then shift Z which means I can move it on every axis but the z-axis, which is up and down. So no matter where I, where I do it, it's not going to go above where I want. And that's kind of how I make sure that everything is on the correct plane. It's just an easier way that I move around the viewport, but that can be whatever somebody gets used to. 
and I'm almost done. This is not going to take too long. I'm going to shade this smooth as well, and I'm going to get some lights in the scene. I have this pro lighting studio that was made by Blender Guru, the guy who had the um, donut tutorial. He's It's one of my favorite add-ons because whenever I'm doing TikToks, I can just add a lighting setup, and when I tab into edit mode, you will be able to see that... Uh, Oh, gorgeous. It, everything is already lit and it's already rendered and it, it works really, really quickly. Oh um, so I guess this could be considered my sculpt for today. I, if you want me to go more in detail, I'm more than happy to. Um, oh, that's gorgeous. That's cool. I just love that. Okay. So earlier I was trying to think about my target audience here and I uh -huh. thought about, you know, who all would want to learn blender. And of course I named people who do watercolor and oil as well as sculptors, which you just mm -hmm. did, but also photographers. You can do all the lighting in a blender as well. You can add suns or, or or add light sources anywhere in the screen i mean that it, it, it's just beautiful it's gorgeous yes it's it's one of my actually it is my favorite computer program ever made there's the versatility on it is truly amazing so okay so who else can you think of who would have an intrinsic interest in learning blender um like yeah, right. like a like a professional in another industry who would maybe like oh, using I mean it just pure interest like oh you like photography well let me show you this in blender you like sculpting yeah i mean there's always the 3d printing community um i think you named on that one in the beginning um there's also the um people who are in the uh, in advertising there's a lot of advertising there and there's one more that I'm trying to think of right now. Oh, yeah, like the small startups, honestly. Like if you want somebody to really understand your idea, the best thing you can do is show them a 3D image of it. That it's going to be a little bit different than like an architectural render or like a, um, like a product designer showing them a sketches. You can actually turn this model as much as you want and see every different side of it. And so somebody who's trying to get started with their own business and has a, a product idea, maybe just like render it up, kind of learn from it. May I ask you real quick? I'm curious. Can you uh, show us how you can add light sources to your sculpt? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. 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 So currently I'm going to turn the lights off that I had. And what I can do is if you do shift A and then go to light, so you can add a point light, a sunlight, a spotlight, and area light. These are all used for different things. I use most of these almost all the time, um, but the one we're gonna use here is an area light. An area light's gonna be like, almost like a fluorescent bulb, okay? So I'm actually also gonna turn off the floor so you can see a little bit better. Um, so I, it's just like, imagine if you're in like an office building and you have like a long light, like going down a hallway and you see multiple of these. You can see in the reflection of its eyes, um, the lights that we're seeing from right here. They're not going to show up in a render, but they will show up in any reflections. Um, and so I'm actually also going to turn the roughness down on those to give it a little bit more of a, yeah, I like that. So that's one light source. Another one that people use a lot is the sunlight. What the sunlight does is it just points the light in any direction where this is facing. So it doesn't matter if, if this light is like not directly over one of these glowing balls, you see it disappears. It just kind of goes away. However, with the sunlight, this will be directional. Whichever way the light is facing, there will be an infin infinite amount of light that is poured in here. Um, and so this is a good way to get that like outdoorsy look um, if the, a sun is required. People also use this to get really nice, um, really nice silhouettes of their item. So if I turn this around and turn the strength of this to 10, which is the highest it can go. If I do a backlighting right here, you can see that I'm getting a really nice shadow, uh, a really nice highlight on the edges of here. And that's usually what I use the sunlight for. Um, but people, people use this for every, every which way. You've done commercials, haven't you? I have. Yeah, I've done a couple. Real quick, I want to hear about those commercials, but also, if you don't mind me asking, it's a bit of a nosy question. Is that how you're supporting yourself right now through your own business of modeling in Blender? Yes, um, I am pretty. I'm pretty financially stable with my current business. I would say that I'm more. I wouldn't necessarily put myself into the 3D commercial um, like specialist yet. Uh, I would say that I would am just a commission artist who uses a lot of contractors to um, get a lot of work done. Uh, I would say that commercials definitely pay the most, and so in some ways they're most worthwhile. But they're also going to be a lot less likely to 
come by rather than um, a couple of people hitting you up on Instagram and asking for maybe their logos or maybe a, a character of themselves in the metaverse or just a cool animation for them. Um, so I wouldn't say I completely make my money off of just commercials. However, it's definitely a, a big um, revenue stream. Can you tell us a little bit about any of the commercials you've done? I don't know what kind of NDA you have, but if you're able to tell us about it. Yeah, uh, I, honestly, I do have a lot of NDAs for them. Okay. Um, I can kind of beat around the bush a little bit. I'll I say that I am designing a building um, and the building is hopefully going to be made in like the here. How do I explain this? I'll say that there are some renovations being done to a certain building in Philadelphia. And with that building, I was able, I had the opportunity to actually figure out what the building could look like and then send that to some of the investors for the building to have that made in real life. So whereas I'm not like the architectural designer and obviously you're going to need to, I can't just make a floating building and be like, let's throw money at it and get it done. Yeah. Um, but if if everything kind of works out and they get the funding that they want from the project, um, I might have um, designed a building at one wow. point. <laughs> that's incredible. Oh, that's so incredible. Uh, now there's other story. You've, you've got a rich history in modeling. Uh, I know in our pre-interview, you talked about a music video that you helped with. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the second commission that I ever got um, was from a guy named Little Mop Top. Little Mop Top, you can find him on Instagram. I think he's like 70, he's at like 78,000 followers and a blue check mark, meaning he's verified. He was one of the first people who really believed in the art that I do. And I, I really wouldn't be where I am today without his guidance. Uh, he's a Philly rapper. And he was actually also the one who told me to get into TikTok, which is probably one of the best uh, business decisions I could have uh, asked for. Really? And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt because we always debate. My wife does, um, it, uh, she does Instagram and a website and we're always on the fence about TikTok. So the fact that you endorse TikTok is quite interesting i'll have to yeah what, oh there's what is that yeah i i genuinely think that you could probably just make it with tiktok if there's any social media platform that's going to do it the most the fastest and the most efficient it's it's the best social media for that specifically because they're they're looking at over two billion downloads with like some crazy like i'm pretty sure they have like close to a billion concurrent users a day sometimes. Um, and that type of, not a billion per day, but there are probably a, close to a billion that log in at least every month. It's, it's some really insane numbers. So if you just play the numbers game and you realize that um, the, the 3D modeling community, let's say is 2 million people um, worldwide who do this type of stuff, um, there's going to be a lot more of those people that you can access just being on TikTok. And um, even though that like Reels on Instagram is doing the same thing in YouTube Shorts, there's there's something very optimized about the algorithm with with um, TikTok that is not being done anywhere else. And so if you if you want to start somewhere, it's it's the TikTok game at this point. Now, may I ask also, so with TikTok, that is very helpful in your estimate with uh, exposure. Is that correct? Because it's not like, as I understand, that there's not not necessarily a way to generate a bunch of, of revenue just from TikTok, but the exposure itself. Correct. Yes. And that that brings me to an interesting point that I, I usually tell people about the differences between social media is um, TikTok is best for views and exposure. However, it has, it has really, really bad um, influence, let's call it. Um, and what I mean by influence is the influence, when I talk about people having influence, it's uh, in a YouTube video. If someone's like, everybody check the link down in my description, I have some really cool merch, go check it out. Uh, the amount of influence you have is how many people are going to click that link in your description. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is kind of how I, I measure it. And so TikTok has some of the worst um worst um, influence in that way. Meaning like I might get a million views on a video. That doesn't mean that a million people are going to click on my buy merch page. Um, but that's extremely different on something like YouTube. If you have a YouTube follower, YouTubers are, have extremely loyal followings and you might get, I don't know, one fifth, like 20% of the people might go to the link in your description because you are so cool to them or you are such an influence. Whereas TikTok, you're going to be lucky if you get like 0.01 percent 
of the people if you say go check it out. So the the YouTube video that I posted today has 126 views in five hours. I would say 50, I have the analytics for that video and 50% of those views came from TikTok. Um, And that being said, currently my TikTok has 40,000 views. And so if you think that 60 people clicked the link in my description, but 40,000 people watched it, what is my, what is my engagement? What is my influence there? Um, That's a pretty easy calculation. I'm just going to do that on my phone. So 40,000 people watching 60 views from TikTok. um, That's going to be 0.0015% of people. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So all these platforms, each of them have have their pros and cons. I mean, there, there's so many online platforms. I know that in, in my own case, I just got overwhelmed. The only thing that we do, you know, I, I, I've got a private podcast or a private podcast. I, I, I've got a, another show that's uh, only on, on a, a podcast. And all we do is Facebook and Twitter because there's just too many of them and it gets overwhelming. But uh, again, each one of them, you know, has their pros and cons and each, each of these uh, assets, well, they're a tool to uh, serve the artist. However, the artist, uh, sees fit. So interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us uh, uh, a little bit more of, uh, about um, what was, I'm sorry, the name of the rapper that... Uh, Little Mop Top. Yes, yes. Tell yeah. us more about that experience. Oh, Little Mop Top, um, he originally reached out to me through... Actually, I'll go back even farther. So I did, in my school, we the, the pitch competition that I was talking about, about before, that's kind of like a regular thing at our school, just entrepreneurs trying to get out there and win some money um, funding their companies. And so another event that they were hosting was a kind of like a private networking event. And it was for any student who wanted to come. And it was about um, online marketing. And um, when I went to when I went to the Zoom call, because this was over, this was over uh, COVID-19. Um, it was, I think, 2020 when this happened. Um, when I went to that Zoom meeting, there were like three or four people waiting around and we waited for like 15 minutes after the person said that they were coming to speak, the, the supervisor who is uh, doing the marketing lecture. And she actually never ended up showing up. And so for about 30 to 40 minutes, I was just talking to the rest of the people in that, in that chat who were waiting for this, this um, lecture. And one of the people in that group was named um, Skywalker with a V. So S K V. Walker, Skywalker. And he was a rapper who was also working with uh, Little Mop Top. And so just because I went to that like optional lecture, I ended up meeting Skywalker, who introduced me to Little Mop Top, who ended up uh, commissioning me for the first um, music video that I did. And you know, he's your former manager. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I w- at this point, I would consider us more like business partner and friends. He still has a pretty big, um, we still have a really good relationship. He actually just moved to um, California, uh, or the West coast, I think like a week or two ago, he hasn't been there for too long, but I, I, it was very sad that that happened, but I'm really happy that he's making a name for himself in the West coast as well. Fabulous. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's all about networking. One of the other interesting things oh, yeah. that you mentioned in your outline, and I think it'd be very, very good, good to talk about is you're obviously are, are a young business professional, uh, that does 3D modeling, and you've had both very positive experiences as well as negative experiences that you've learned from. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give you I'll give you a positive experience. Um, one positive is that I am doing what I love uh, genuinely. Like when I started the everyday stuff, I had no intention of making money off of this. I just wanted to become a better artist and um, just kind of explore and blender. And one of the things I didn't expect is that I could have turned this thing that I absolutely have like huge passion for into an actual business. And um, what I always tell young entrepreneurs, maybe freshmen who are coming into the same major is the first, the most important thing in entrepreneurship is just to find the thing that you love doing and you're passionate about, and then figure out how to monetize it later. 
Uh, if, if you show your passion and your excitement for the stuff that you do every day, people are going to want in on that. Um, and I think one of the reasons I got my first commission uh, after my daily art is because in my some of my descriptions where I talk about these works, like I was just kind of going on, just rambling about this stuff. And even though nobody was actually looking at my uh, Instagram post at that time, I was getting like three likes or whatever, all from like people I knew. It was still like I was doing it because I loved it. And I know that's what um, Little Mop Top saw when he was looking at my work. And I also know that like a lot of people who came after that just really saw the appeal there. And then I'll, I'll share the kind of the one of the bad experiences. Um, probably the worst experience that I've had, um, barring just like commissions falling through because they, I mean, a lot of work stuff like that falls through. Like you can't have a hundred percent acceptance of when people ask for an interview, it's like, I would say about 20 to 30% of the time we actually go through a commission, whether it be because there are too uh it's too expensive and they don't want to pay it or maybe it's the work is too much or whatever it is i would say probably the worst experience i had is i was uh, i was commissioned by a director to be a vfx supervisor on set of another music video and um technically i i don't necessarily want to share who that artist is at this moment um they have around 500,000 views on instagram and they have like four or five million monthly users uh or listeners um and so they're really big and it was a huge opportunity however they contacted me 11 days before the video was due and i had 10 days after the shoot to make 120 vfx shots um, and if anybody knows anything about VFX, like good VFX, one shot can take you easily two weeks, right? It's like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into making uh, somebody look like they should be in an environment. So everything was shot in green screen in New York. And then they kind of um, outlined the video. There were a, really, a lot of really nice editors who were there who made the video and uh, counting up after, I think after they finished the edit five days in, um, I had... I had five days to complete 120 VFX shots. And it got to the point where I'd been working on this thing for uh, 15 to 18 hours a day for the last five days. And I was exhausted and I didn't see a, a way that this could be done. And I eventually had to quit um, afterwards, which is the first thing I've ever quit um, to this day. And I just said to the director that it was really not sustainable for my business and the employees I had working, the people who were compositing, the people who were keying everything and the rotoscoping. Uh, there was just a lot that went into it. And I, I didn't want to push my team any harder to fit the unrealistic expectations of this director. So I kind of threw the towel in at like 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, and that was kind of the worst experience I had, though I don't regret it, not not in the slightest. I I think that there are a lot of examples of people just kind of putting their head down and trying to do the work even when it's not good for them. And that can be pretty damaging in the long run if you don't speak up about the conditions that you work yes. in. You know what? Oh my goodness, my heart goes out to you on that. I, I definitely feel like as a creative artistic type, it's <laughs> sometimes difficult to know the scope of an investment before you commit to it. I remember mm -hmm. I would do things like I'd be in charge of decorating a haunted house and it would be like uh, all of my time would go into it. I'd have all these ideas one after the other just kept coming and I'd have zero scope of, you know, of knowing what, what is actually feasible. Um, wow. So yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely um, empathize with that story and, th and that lesson. In fact, uh, there's also, there was a recent article that came out about some of the difficult um, working, working uh, conditions of uh, VFX artists who do a lot of the popular superhero m movies now. Um, so that is an ongoing topic is the time and the scope of the work. So that's mm -hmm. definitely a very, a very good lesson. Thank you very much for sharing that. I, I certainly appreciate that. I know that's uh it's hard to talk about what it what doesn't um, work out well, but that's, that's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many more things in my notes here. I'd like to give some deference to you. If there's something that you specifically want to talk about, if not, I, I have got many things here, including uh, mathematics and procedural materials as well as <laughs> future plans and things like that. So yeah. Do you have any favorite things that you like uh, talking about? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, in Blender, I there's, there is honestly so much good stuff in Blender that um, I, I would say that I probably do enjoy procedural materials um, the most. 
I have I really love their node network. It's it's something that I I really had an affinity for as soon as I started, and maybe it's because I've done a little bit of programming um in the few uh, in the past, um and a lot of node programming where it's basically like kind of the scratch, like you put one block in and then you connect that to another block, and that's like an if this like if then statements and stuff like that. And the way that procedural textures in Blender work is, is pretty similar where you use a little bit of math and a little bit of like vector and RGB math, basically um, kind of like hex codes, how you know that hex codes have six values and these six values represent um, the two first ones are red, the, the two middle ones are blue, the last ones are green. It's kind of a tangent, but um, using those values and then adding and subtracting them together, I find is a very interesting concept, just how computer science can be mixed with um, location data and rotation data and how you can all plug that into like a creative field rather than just straight up computer science. I think that's a very interesting um, kind of feature that a lot of programs have, not only Blender. I'm actually really glad that you brought this up. In short order, I want us to show the audience some of what a procedural material looks like. But first, I want to say that uh, where I work, uh, I'm known as the artist. Basically, a lot of my notepads are filled with sketches here, there, and everywhere. So, of course, they think that I'd be a natural modeler. Now, I want to mention there was a modeler who was employed in my position before I came along, and he did not consider himself an artist, although I would disagree. He did things 100% procedurally because he's really into directions and really into programming. And, and, and again, I know that programming is a very, very important skill that I think they're teaching the kids uh, um, younger and younger. It, it's an incredibly important skill. And the fact that you can create art procedurally with just really well written programs is uh, pretty cool. Um, I think that his materials are actually better than anything that I can create with a virtual brush. Um, and again, when, you know, he, he, he um, made them procedurally, he would do things like get like a, you know, a, a texture that looked like um, cracks in the ground. I think in Blender, it's called the Musgraves texture. And he'd um, mix it with a variety of colors of, of like mud and dirt and stuff and do all these instructions. And suddenly when you drop the material in, it looks like cracked mud and it looks uh, again, almost photo um, realistic. I, you know, I, I, I thought it was fabulous. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'd love to see some of your procedurals if you're comfortable with that. I can just show you live those things, or I could show you a couple TikToks about them. Let's, let's do both. Actually, we have time to do both. Can you show us live first? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'll just um, preview it on this thing that we've made here. Okay. Um, and I will delete everything that I was going to do. So this is the model that we have now. Currently, this is the principled BSDF. And that basically is just like, let's just call it a default material. Um, I'm going to be using the word texture and material interchangeably. They are very much not interchangeable. A material is a 3D, um, a 3D thing where a material can be very shiny and not very rough and have a, a base color, but a texture is going to be like almost like a PNG. Um, so they are not the same thing, but this principled BSDF is a legitimate material because it has like a slider for metallic and it has one for roughness. And so if I make this a really metallic, um, a really metallic, I guess, number or met a metallic value of one, and then turn the roughness down, you'll be able to see these lights a little bit better. Um, and so you can get some pretty sco cool stuff like that. Um, another one that I love messing around with is if you click shift A and then click on the search bar, uh, or you could just go into textures and then go to the wave texture. The wave texture is one of my favorites to play around with. And I'm also going to grab a color ramp. What you can do with these two, is plug in the wave texture to the base color. And you can see that you have these black and white lines. To change the way those look, I'm going to add the color ramp in the middle. And then I'm going to slide these values closer to each other. So they're like harder lines here. Um, I'm then going to turn the scale down on this wave texture. And I'm actually gonna turn metallic off cause it's kind of distracting just a little bit. Um, and so this is what it looks like currently. I would maybe see this as in zebra stripes, possibly. And um, if you add a little bit of distortion, you can get you can get the texture looking very weird. Um, maybe add a little bit of detail here. And next, I'm going to turn the roughness 
down just a little bit so you can see more of the reflection. And this is kind of a basic procedural texture. There is not an image that is controlling how it looks here. These This wave texture is kind of like if I do con shift control and then click, this is what the actual map looks like. Um, this is like every value from darkest to lightest, meaning um, light being a value of one and dark being a value of zero. This is kind of what the computer is seeing. And I am plugging it into this color ramp, which is inverting the colors just because of these sliders right here. And then I'm plugging it into the principal BSDF, which is giving it the real reflection. Um, like if I go back to here, you can see that there's nothing reflecting off of it because it's a texture. But if you plug it into the principal BFDF, you can see that there's an actual like reflection and a value for um, subsurface scattering and stuff. Interesting. Now um, let's take a look at some of your TikToks that show some of the other materials that you've made. I have my TikTok page up. I'll actually show you a material. Oh, actually, I'll show you the geometry notes because this is also completely procedural. Okay. So this is when Blender 3.0 just came out and I was like, holy crap, like I can finally use it. Your first Blender geometry node setup. First, you're gonna get an instance on points and two cubes. Connect the cube to the points and instances. What we're gonna be doing is distributing some points on this cube with more cubes. Turn the density up and down to get more cubes. We're gonna get a must drive to control the movement and we're gonna separate the X, Y, and Z to the scale. You can see if we turn the scale up and down of these, the points change. Set your Musgrave to 4D and then do hashtag frame to see which frame you're on and then divide that by 100 to make it a little bit slower like this. Turn up the density of cubes and actually turn up the cube size so you get more detail. X, take the scale of your Musgrave to get the desired effect you want. Add a join geometry and connect the original cube with it so you get a cube under it. Set the materials you want. I use a bright and a clear texture. Turn the scale up to get more detail. And if you want to see how I did the textures, one is just a transmission with a really low roughness, and then one is a gradient texture with a color ramp connected to the emission. This is my geometry nodes. Thanks for watching. That is amazing. That's like a hot lava cube kind of thing. I don't know. How would you describe yeah. that? What terms would you use? Like a hot lava cube? Yeah, hot lava cube is about where that's at. Um, the the way the reason I um did that texture is because my friend Evan, he works in Cinema 4D and uh, Unity and some Unreal. And he had a procedural texture that looked very similar to this. And I was like, you know, Ge Geometry Nodes just came out. I'm going to see if I can try to create something pretty similar. Not exactly the same because his was like a texture that was like only used that geometry. Um, but the one I made is like I talked about before, procedural geometry. Yeah. You know what? I think if you don't mind, I might even open up this interview with that video. I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. It's just, it's fantastic. So, uh, and in the yeah. time left, I'd love to see some more of your procedural materials too. This is a, I kind of already, the texture I could show you was kind of what I just did. So I'll show you, um, I'll show you these water droplets. Blender water droplets this is going to be a 40 second tutorial on how to make condensation. First, you're going to go shift A to add a meta ball. Turn the resolution down so you can see it better. Turn the roughness down and the transmission up for a glass shader. Next, add a particle system and then put the render as the object, which is in the metal ball. They're really big right now, so turn down the scale. Uh, my blender crashes here, so don't worry about that. Here, I'm just tweaking the droplets a little bit more, but they're a little too even. We're gonna get to why that is later. Go to weight paint and then draw where you want the bubbles to be. Set the weight paint to density. Aha, I found it. Use modifier stack and then you add a subdivision to make it a little smoother. Turning scale randomness down and then resolution viewport to whatever you want. These videos actually do take a bit of time to edit, so please follow if you like them. Thank you. That's like photographic right there. That would have fooled me. It's incredible. <laughs> I My mind is completely blown. So what I love about this is as I'm watching your videos, I'm reminded of other videos that I've seen where somebody will make something in Blender and I, I don't know the procedure, but they'll export it and then they'll import it into a video of themselves with uh, Adobe After Effects or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I wonder if you and I watched the same tutorial. There was a tutorial that I watched on cell fracturing, and it was a, a, a gentleman, and I forgot his name. He's on YouTube, where he does a uh, he he yeah, pretended to throw an energy an energy ball at the wall, and the wall just crumbled, and he did mm -hmm. that entire thing in cell fracture. Does that sound familiar to you? I I have watched that video. Yes, <laughs> that's a good um, one. <laughs> I use self okay, I want to tell you why I use cell fracture at work. Actually, now okay. I'm not going to go into super high detail about what I do at work because of NDAs and stuff like that. But I had to do, uh, I had to model some collapsed uh, rubble uh, from like a building, say after an earthquake or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
And I just used the cell fracture where you start off with a square and then you, uh, it's not really procedurally because Blender comes with it. You don't have to build anything. You know, as soon as you download Blender, you have the cell fracture add-on, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all you have to do is go to, to what, uh, settings and add-ons or something. Um, yep. Um, it's in the preferences, uh, panel <laughs> in the edit tab. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> In that video, he shows how all you do is you use your, I think it's called the grease pencil, and you draw a bunch of cracks on something. Then mm -hmm. when you run the cell fracture function, I don't know why I'm spending all this time telling our audience about it. We should show our audience. Do you happen to have one of those videos? Uh, I, I do have one of those videos. It's one of my most popular videos, actually. Okay. Um, people really seem to like this one. This was this video I, I put out right after I got 930,000 on this video. I was like, Oh wow! Like people actually want to see Blender content. Like I, who who knew? <laughs> um, and so I created this one. It's called Blender Physics are not that hard. Okay. People think Blender Physics are so difficult, but I'm going to tell you how to do your first. First, you're going to add a cube and a ground plane. You're going to your annotation pencil, and you're going to show where all the breaks are going to be. You're going to need the cell fracture add-on. So go to properties and install that. These don't really matter, but set it to annotation pencil, and then the source limit is how many pieces you want it to be broken into. Next is going to be the most challenging part, which is really not that challenging. You're going to go to rigid body and then turn the plane to a passive object so then the pieces can fall on the ground. You're going to select one of your pieces and turn it to have a lot of friction because we're going to make this gold. You're going to do a rigid body and then calculate the mass of the shape that you're in and then turn it to a gold object. The mass here is 2,400 kilograms, which is a lot because, I mean, gold weighs a lot. And you're going to copy from active, meaning all of these pieces will have the same properties. Finally, to make the object more realistic, you set the mass of a piece to a gold in the objects panel, and even after this tutorial. And that was also the first place that I learned to um, do a repeating video and possibly get a couple people watching it for the second time over. Uh, <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. That's, that's so, so much fun. Okay, before we go any further, I want to make sure our audience knows exactly where to find you so everyone can you know follow you and root for you and watch your success. Where can they find you? <laughs> Yeah, people can find me at Lenica Digital on any platform, uh, Google, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. I'm not going to lie. I've had so much fun uh, seeing everything that you do is, is um, inspirational. I almost feel like the analogy that I use is uh, I feel like a wizard. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> Harry Potter when uh, Hagrid says, you're a wizard, Harry. That's kind of how I feel like. You know what I mean? Like you're almost an alchemist that can do anything. Um, I saw you do the self-fracture with a gold material of course i used a brick material you can do any of the above you know brick or gold or glass and when i was first learning how to be a modeler about a year ago in november um i had a model of a of um, a certain vehicle i think it was like a, a world war ii era tank and uh, it was made out of metal of course but i was playing with it i made it out of wood and then with a simple drop of a material i made it out of glass and all kinds of stuff. I just had so much fun. It was ridiculous. So yeah, the fact awesome. that Blender is free and that anyone can use Blender and learn how to do these things. And the fact that it's as easy as going to YouTube and typing, how do I do this in Blender? How do I start in Blender? There's no excuse for not learning this stuff. It's incredible. It's awesome. So I am thrilled to have you here today on my very first show. And uh, thank you for, for being here and teaching us uh, everything that you've taught us and telling us your story. I really appreciate that. Is there anything that you want to say in our closing minutes? Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just kind of reiterate what you said, because I, I find it very true, where if you got a little bit of extra time or you want to get better at your art, um, just start posting stuff every day. Um, just put it anywhere out into the world, um, whether it just be for fun or to start a business. Um, the most important thing about doing an, any artistic thing or uh, and learning any skill is just practicing. Um, if I if I was beating myself up for how my renders looked a week in, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I think it's just important to keep doing what you love and uh, you'll find that thing over time. Oh, totally agree. Totally agree. And you're right. You got to be patient with yourself and, and, and learn a little bit at a time. It's not like you'll become a, a professional overnight, but uh, um, yeah, well, it's been incredible. It's been incredible having you here. Um, real quick, I'll say after we close, I hope you stay in the line for just a bit because I want to talk for sure. about the editing process here. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much. And with that, that concludes our very first episode. Join us next time. Follow me. I am TechPodGabe on Twitter and all of the handles, uh, TikTok and Twitter. I don't have an Instagram yet. My wife is beating me up um, about that. Uh, I do have a Facebook. Um, so search for TechPodGabe and I'll, I will be 
I will, I'll be uploading this show to YouTube. If you just search for 3D Art with Gabe, you'll find shows like this and many other uh, and many others. Um, so we hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.